Glad you're here today, uh, kicking off a brand new series we're calling James. Uh, before we move any further into the message, though, I've got a couple of announcements I want to share with you. Number one, very near and dear to my heart, been praying about it for a while. It came, information came out this past week, the SEC tournament is staying in Birmingham. Yeah. Pretty pumped, pretty pumped about that. I might have shouted when I, when I got the, uh, the tweet or the text message this past week. I've been really, really worried about it. <laughs> hey, uh, another thing I want to share with you before we go forward is uh, today at Information Central, you need to pick up one of these. It's a small group uh, directory, small group directory for our summer semester. Semester kicks off next Sunday. So make sure that uh, before you leave today, you go and grab one of these small group directories, decide what small group you want to be a part of, and contact that leader. And let's, let's build community this summer together. It's a short semester, six weeks. So it's going to be, a, there's a lot of cool groups in here. So make sure you get a part. I'll give you a shameless plug. If you want to go on a mission trip, I've got a small group this semester. We're, we're going to Juarez this year. Uh, we've talked about that over the past couple of months together, but we're going to meet together this semester, this small group semester, and we're going to be praying over Juarez, praying over the, the stuff that we're going to be doing there on mission. Uh, we're going to be raising money together. So um, if you're cool, you'll go to Juarez with us. All right? All right, you'll go with us. That We're going this December, so let's go ahead and start making plans and be a part of that small group uh, with me this semester. All right, if you've got your notes, you can go ahead and pull those out. We're in what I told you a while ago. We're, in the, we're going to be studying the book of James all month long. It's a great summer series, I think. I think it's just an incredible summer series. James was the brother of Jesus, the, or what we would call today the half-brother of Jesus. Joseph and Mary uh, had children after Jesus was born, and, and James was one of his brothers. And, and we'll read this verse in James chapter 1, verse 5, the top of your notes. Really the theme verse of the book that he wrote. He was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, really kind of a, uh, anybody ever know someone who's just to the point, kind of dry and to the point? You know, they don't beat around the bush at all. That's James. You can tell that by the book that he reads. I mean, the book that he wrote. Uh, he, he says hello to people, and then he kind of just dives right in. But the theme verse is James 1, 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you, and he will not rebuke you for asking. Many people have called James the Proverbs of the New Testament because it's so practical. Literally, he, get, he says hello, and then he dives right into talking. We can, matter of fact, we can read together just the first verse there in James. It says this. Uh, he says, this letter is from James, a slave of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. He says, hello. And then he dives right in it. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. So the first things I want to talk to you today as we get into the book of James all month long, and we're going to study really the parts of the first chapter today, and he dives into talking about two things that up front, people kind of wonder, why in the world is he connecting these two things together? He talks about trials, or what we would call tests, and then he talks about temptations, and we're calling those bait today. So the, uh, the title of your message is The Test and Bait, The Test and Bait. And we're going to pray together, and then we're just going to dive into what we think that looks like. James talks about it, and he says in the be very beginning of the passage, he said, listen, life is this way. You're going to have trouble. <laughs> Jesus said it. He said, in this world, you will face many troubles. He said, but I have overcome the world. Take heart because I've overcome the world. And, and James is saying the same thing. It's not if you're going to face a trial. It's not if tests are coming. It's when tests are coming. So how do we as believers through the book of James, I think it's one of the most practical books. I think it's also one of the most important books because James is addressing the church in Jerusalem full of people who are really good in a culture to say, I am a believer, but actually not live it out actually not walk it out. So that's very similar to the culture we're living in today. It's okay. It's very easy to say I am a believer. I am a Christian, especially here in the South. But it's not, it's, it's not as uh, recognizable sometimes for people that say they are believers that actually live it out and look like they are believers by the life that they live. And James writes the entire book. He writes it out and he said, listen, this is how your faith, this is how you give legs to your faith. This is how you make faith work in real day, everyday life. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you'll pray with me and we'll dive into the notes 
Father, we love you. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for books like James. Thank you for men who were inspired by you to write letters to his church. And God, that he gave instruction on how to, to, how to do more than just say this thing called Christianity. How to do more than just say we are or say that we believe in Jesus. But Father, you gave us, you gave us uh, instructions on how to put legs to our faith. And so Father, today we open up your word and we ask over these next few minutes, these just two uh, topics that we talk about, t- trials and tests. And, and temptations and, and the bait of the enemy in our life, God, that we would learn how to resist the enemy and, and draw near to you, that we would, re- we, we would learn how to pass the tests that come through our life and how, to, and how to run from temptation as a result of the endurance you're building in us. We honor you. We thank you for the work you're doing in us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Anybody, anybody ever go through trouble, t- trials in your life? Maybe you're here today. I can tell you this. We go, we've gone through, my family, we're going through trials, and there's trials now. It seems like all the the time there's one around the corner. Who'd be honest to say, hey, there's stuff in my life we're going through. I'm going through some trials. I'm going through some stuff. Many of you in here saying, hey, I'm going through some trials. I'm going through some testing times in my life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and he right off the bat talks about it. And the first thing that we need to do if we're going to understand how to pass the test, how to get through the trials is number one, if you're taking notes, we've got to recognize it. We've got to recognize it. We've got to recognize that it is a test. We've got to recognize that it's not just something that we're going through, uh, but it is for a purpose and for a reason. It's a test. Anybody ever taken tests in life? We've got some good test takers in here. Anybody, anybody, anybody? How about some bad test takers? I don't, everybody, everybody. I don't take tests well. Many people, I don't take tests well. I've never been a good tester. I've never been a good tester, never taken, never done a really good job at testing. It took, it would take me studying for hours and hours and hours to to like make a C (laughs) on a test to make a B, you know, on, on, and when I was testing. And James talks about it in James 1 through 3, uh, verse, verses 1 through 3, says, this letter's from James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes, the Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. In other words, I am writing to believers here, people who know Jesus. This is what you Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Verse 3, it says, for you know that when your faith is tested, everybody say tested. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a test to grow. Not if your faith is tested. The truth is our faith at all, at all of us at some point in our life, our faith is always going to be tested. Now, we'll talk about this in just a minute. God never tempts us. The Bible says that God would never tempt us to sin. But it does not say, and it, and it teaches us all through Scripture, that he will 100% allow us to go through testing seasons in our life. He will test the faith that we have. You can see it from the beginning of Scripture all the way through Revelation. You can see it in the beginning where he took Abraham to the top of a mountain and, and gave him the instruction to sacrifice his own son. The Bible tells us that God was testing him, trying his faith. Now I know, Abraham, that, you, uh, that I am number Number one in your life. Over and over and over again, we can see where God has tested the people who, who claim to know him and claim to have relationship with him. It's tests in life that move us to the next levels in our life. So we need to know if we're going through a season of frustration, if we're going through a season of trial, if there's something going on in our life, the first thing we need to be able to do as believers is recognize it for what it is. It's a test. Many people are going through the same testing seasons over and over and over again. Do you know what I learned when I was in school? What happens when I fail a test? I have to take it again, <laughs> over and over and over again. And many of us have gone through testing seasons of our life, and we can't seem to figure out why in the world can't I get over or can't I get past this thing in my life? Why does every relationship I find myself in fail? Why every single year I'm trying my best to get out of financial turmoil, but why am I always in it? Why does this test, why does this trial, this season of life always seem to circle back around? The truth is what's going on is we're probably failing those tests. We're not doing well in the testing that God's placing us in. And we need to know this, that God's desire is to move us forward in life. He wants us to move from one season of life to a better season of life. It's his purpose. His plan in life is for our good and for his glory. But you need to know that it's it's how I respond to the testing seasons of life make the difference of when I'm going to move forward in the next times in our life. I remember the first hermeneutics class I was in in college, hermeneutics, how to study the Bible, how how to break down scripture. And I remember my professor walked in, I'm a freshman in college and 
He walks in and he tells us to grab a sheet of paper out and he asks us four questions. And, you know, we were like, all right. So we, we write down these questions and then he asks us to write our name on it and turn it in. It was a test. <laughs> he gave us a test the first day of class and we all failed it miserably. First reason was because we didn't even realize what he was doing. We didn't recognize he was testing us. And I remember I've, I've been teaching my daughter how to ride a bike seemingly for the past couple of years, I've been teaching her how to ride a bike. Uh, it, it doesn't, it hasn't seemed to go, be going well uh, up until recently. I, I remember uh, when she was four, going in, um, when she had just turned five years old, I told my wife, all right, the training wheel's got to go. I was, I, you know, I, I probably don't remember, but I was like, I was three when I rode a bike, so she can ride a bike. So I was kind of prideful, I'm sure, but so I took the training wheels off and she fell like 15 feet into it. And I'm telling you, when she was five, she fell off that bike and she began to cry. And it was like a whole 30 minute experience and we had to put band-aids over every over every little boo-boo in her on her body. She looked like a mummy when we were done putting band-aids on her. And we had to put the training wheels back on because bike riding was not gonna happen for a while. Anybody been there? With you? I mean it's just it was traumatizing for her. But recently I began to do it again and I began to raise the training wheels up and we began to just test her and teach her how to keep her balance. And I remember a couple of weeks ago I took her to a park full of grass, a field full of grass, and I thought, well, if she falls this time, at least it'll be on the grass. So I took the training wheels off and I began to push her around this park and, and she got about 30 yards away and then she fell again. Not only did she fall, but when she got up, she fell in the middle of a massive sticker patch. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, oh my Lord, my daughter's never going to ride a bike. <laughs> She's never going to get past this point. But you know what my daughter did that surprised me that was a massive victory for me? She's not yet quite there. She's going about 25, 30 yards at a time and hadn't quite got the balance thing yet. But you know what she did? She didn't cry. She stood up. She picked the stickers out of her own hands and off of her arms. And she got the bike and pushed it a little forward and said, all right, Dad, let's try again. And what I began to learn, what it taught me, it taught me a huge lesson. My daughter is building endurance. It's not a big deal anymore. She doesn't have to be wrapped up like a mummy every time she falls. She's learning that it's okay to fall. And you know, if you're ever going to ride a bicycle, you got to be okay with falling, don't you? You got to be okay with the fall and know it's not going to kill you. You're going to get back up and try again. Eventually, she's going to ride the bike. And so is the same way in life. There are tests that come. There are times that, that God tests our faith, sees how good we're going to balance on the bike that he gives us. And, and we've got to be able, when we fall, we've got to be able to know it's just a test and it's okay. And God is building my endurance which means this, it brings us to our second point. If I know and I recognize that it's a test, I recognize that the financial turmoil I'm in is a test, the relationship issues that I'm in, that's a test, the season of life, the job that I'm in, that's a test. If I can recognize that and I understand that it's God's plan and it's for my good and for his glory, he's growing my endurance, number two, I gotta let it grow. I gotta let it grow. So he tells us in verse 4, he tells us in verse 3, it's to build our endurance. It's so that our endurance may, uh, the chance to, so it gives our endurance a chance to grow. And in verse 4, maybe you want to underline that first little phrase, so let it grow. For when your endurance has fully developed, you will, be you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Isn't that great? You will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Meaning there's every trial, every test that we go through in our life is for a purpose. It's for a reason. It's to, it's to give our endurance a chance to grow. And as believers, we've got to get to a point in our own life where we have to just let it grow. We have to recognize it's a test and it's a tough season of life. But instead of running away from it, instead of quitting, instead of giving up and saying, I don't want to do this anymore, we've got to let it grow. We've got to work the process that God's got us in in our life. It says that, listen, Christian, the Christian life has never been about not suffering. It's never been about that. Many people think, and we've been wrongfully taught over the years, over the past, recent years, especially in America, that, that coming to faith in Christ erases all harm and all hurt and all, and all uh, situations in our life. And Jesus is just going to take care of everything. And we've kind of been taught that Jesus is this proverbial uh, uh, genie in a bottle, that if, we go through, if we're going through anything in life, we can just pray and he'll take it all away. That's kind of what we've been taught in, in this Christian walk. But we need to know that the, really the Christian life over and over and over again, all, through in the, all throughout the Bible, it talks about this joy in suffering. Joy, finding joy in suffering. Now that doesn't make sense, does that? What in the world are you talking about? Finding the value in going through difficult times in life. I'm going to show you two of them. Number one is Romans 5, 3, and 4. It's not in your notes. It'll be on the screens, but you can write that down and reference it later. It says, we can rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. 
We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. What in the world? For we know that they are to help us develop endurance. It's a test. Everybody say test. It's a test. It's a test. It's a trial. We can rejoice when we're going through something difficult because we begin to recognize, oh, Oh, this is a test. God's trying to move me forward. God's trying to move me forward in life. It's a test because it's to help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strength strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Wow, isn't that awesome? It develops. If we're going through trials, I need to recognize, man, this is a test. God is moving me. God is ready to move me forward in life. And I need to, he's wanting to grow my endurance so that I can handle what's coming ahead. So he's testing me. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. So be truly glad. Notice it says the very both verses talk about finding joy, seeing the value in suffering. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show you how your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith, uh, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Christ is revealed to the whole world. So we got to let it grow. Why? Because if we allow it to grow and we allow God's process to take root in our hearts, it builds our endurance. It builds our strength of character. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not this shallow believer who claims to have faith in Jesus, but can't walk it out in times of trial, and I, who claims to have faith in Jesus, but every time it gets tough, I walk away from faith in Jesus. I walk away from community in my local church. I I'm not in small groups. I kind of get on an island by myself. God's trying to move us past those points. God's trying to move us and grow our strength of character and grow our faith in him. And the only way that will happen is if we allow the test and the trials that he places us in to come to fruition. So he's teaching us in the book of James, he's teaching us, find it joy when we, find, when we go through trials. Consider it great joy because God is seeing us worthy to move up in our faith in him, to strengthen our character and faith in him. So I've got to let it grow. Listen, you're going to face test. It's not if, it's when. If you're, not a t if you're not in a testing season in life right now, guess what? You're fixing to be. You're going to be because God's design and purpose in your life, the Bible calls it a sanctification process, meaning this, that as we grow in our faith, we're getting closer and closer to looking like Jesus, to being like Jesus, to acting like Jesus. And the Bible says there's going to come a day when we see him face to face that we will be like Jesus. It's the sanctification process. That's a big word in the Christian world, but it's literally, it's the, it's the, it's the morphing us to become like Christ. That's what he's trying to do. That's what trials, that's what the testing seasons or four. So let it grow. And then number three, he gives us a way. He gives us a way. Hey, how are you going to let it grow? You don't have to do it all by yourself. We need to ask for help. We need to ask for help. He goes on in James 1, 5, it's our theme verse. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He'll not even rebuke you for asking. Maybe you want to underline that word wisdom or highlight it in your notes or in your Bible. Wisdom is the ability to apply what you probably already know. That's what wisdom is. It's the ability, it's the wisdom, it's the ability to apply the knowledge you've already attained. So when you say, hey, I'm in, the, I'm, in the, I'm in between a rock and a hard place. Anybody been that way in life? I don't know which way to turn. I don't know what decisions I need to make. The Bible says don't just figure it out. Don't just quit or just stall. The Bible says go to God. Ask him for help. I'm in this season of testing. I'm in this season of, of trials. I'm in this season of hurt, and, and I don't know which way to turn. God, what do I do? But here's what most people ask. Say, they, don't, they don't go and ask God for wisdom. They go and ask God to get them out. God, get me out of this. <laughs> I don't like this. This is hard. This isn't easy. Remove me from this situation. But you, don't, you haven't recognized it's a test yet. And instead of saying, God, get me out, God, get me out, you need to be saying, God, what do I need to learn right now? What's the thing that I need to learn in this season of life that I'm in? So that means this, that if we can ask that and we realize that it's a test and God is really giving us a cheat sheet, <laughs> he's giving us the answers, we can determine how fast this testing process goes. Because really it all is determined on how quick I learn the lesson. If I learn what God's trying to teach me, I can move from this season of life to the next season of life that much quicker. And the Bible says if we can just go to God and ask for help, it's a promise in his word. He obligates gates himself to help us and give us wisdom in every season of life. But it, it baffles my mind. 
It baffles my mind because you would think, well, that's just an easy answer. Move on to the next, right? But it baffles my mind how long we wait as believers to actually go to God and ask for help. We try to figure it out over and over on myself, on our own. We try to we make decisions here and decisions over here, and all of it seems to be falling apart. And then when we finally hit the rock bottom, we go, God, I need your help. <laughs> I've gone far enough. What? But the Bible says instantly we need to know we can, if you lack wisdom, go to God, ask for help. And then number three, I'll share with number four, I'll share with you. I think this is even more important, really one of the most important is if I realize it, if I recognize it's a test, I'm allowing it to grow. I'm allowing God to build my endurance. I'm asking him for help. Number four is you need to check your attitude. You need to check your attitude. We all do as believers. Now there's, let me read the verse and, and I'll talk to you about it. One, James 1, 6 and 7 says, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith, maybe you want to underline that, your faith is in God alone. Do whatever a person would divide, uh, do, not what, do not waver. For a person div- with a divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. One translation says it's like a person who's double-minded in all of their ways. You know what I've learned over the years as a synonym, a good word for faith is attitude. A really good word for faith is attitude. They're almost irreplaceable in, in a sense. You ever, anybody ever had, uh, been around someone who's just got a horrible attitude in every season and every situation? And no matter what, they're just going to be a pessimist about the situation. They're going to be pessimist about the, uh, the, just a bad attitude. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't seem to fall their way. And they, and, they, and, they go, and they justify their bad attitude by saying this. See, I told you so. I told you it wouldn't work. I told you it wouldn't go that way. I knew all along. And everybody go, and they justify that by saying, hey, I'm, not, I'm just not an optimist. I'm a realist. I'm just a realist. No, you have a bad attitude. And when you have a bad attitude, when you have a bad attitude, it will reproduce itself in your life. The Bible says you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. So if you sow negative in your life over and over and over again, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get negative. If you sow distrust in God over and over and over again in your life, the Bible says you do, you shouldn't expect to receive anything from him. No, what the Bible's saying is you need to have a positive attitude. And this isn't just some name it and claim it idea, but this is just growing your faith in the Lord. This is going, hey, you know what? It doesn't look good right now, but I know that God's in control and his plan is for my good for his glory, and it's going to work out. I'm reminded of a a passage in scripture in Daniel where the three Hebrew slaves were thrown into a fiery furnace. They were the epitome, the epitome to me of good attitude. They were facing literal death in a furnace, but they had an attitude that said, you know what, king, you can do what you want to do, but we're trusting in the name of our God, and even if he doesn't deliver us, we're never going to stop trusting him. We know that eventually he's going to work it out, and whatever that looks like, and however that turns out, our faith is still in him, and not man. So you can't give me a bad attitude. You know, when, when, uh, when Shepard came, came a few weeks early, I sat in that hospital room and they had told us all kinds of fears and things that could happen. But I can promise you, I just had a good attitude about it. I just said, you know what? God's in control. The Bible says that children are a gift from God and blessed is the family whose quiver is full of them. And we just know he's going to work it out. And my wife was sitting in the, in the hospital bed going, you're going to have to change, Brandon. You, I, I'm freaking out. She's like, how are you so excited about everything? I said, sweetheart, I just know God's in control. It's going to be okay. And some of us just need someone in our life who has a good attitude that can encourage us through the hard times of life, can can encourage you through the testing seasons of life. You don't need to surround yourself with negative people and hurtful people that never want to be positive about anything. I'm telling you, you you shouldn't expect to receive anything from God with a bad attitude. Your attitude determines your faith. Your attitude determines which direction you're going. And we need to know that we've got a good attitude. Faith is all about my attitude. It's all about my attitude. Attitude says this, I don't see it, but God, I'm just going to trust you. God, I don't see the outcome right now, but Father, I know you're good and you're going to work it out. And, and let's just be honest. What harm is it to have a good attitude? What harm is it? What good do you do with a pessimistic attitude? What good are you doing with your family? Just going, I told you so. I mean, just because you have the knowledge. or uh, Like, okay, what, what good did that do to bring the morale down in your family and, your, and in your job or in your relationships? It does no good to be, just to be a, a, a bad attitude all the time. You need to have, you need to check your attitude and say, God, you know what? I know, I recognize it's a test, and this time I'm going to pass. 
This time I'm moving. I'm not going to respond like I always have. God, I know you're building my endurance. You're building my faith. You're building my uh, resilience. God, I am going to pass the next test. It's a testing season. And then he goes on from there. And then he goes right into talking about temptation. And a lot of people go, well, why in the world did he do that? Because they connect together. They connect together. He goes from talking about this straight into temptations. We need to know this. Maybe you want to write this down. Trials, trials in life help us defeat temptations. Every trial you go through in your life, it's for a purpose so that you can overcome a soon coming temptation. Let me show it to you. Number one, if you're taking notes, how do I know it's bait? I think one of the greatest analogies of what temptation is, it's like the devil fishing in a pond and we're all fish and he's just throwing that lure right in front of us. And, he's just, and he knows exactly what bait to throw. Every one of us, he knows exactly what bait to throw that's going to entice us in. He knows that, and, and many of you, you need to know this. It's not just going to be any temptation. You're probably like me. The enemy could throw a hundred different baits in front of me, but only one's actually going to work. I'm not even remotely interested in most of the baits he throws, but I know there's, he knows there's one bait that I will be tempted. My own desires will draw me in. And that's many of us. But you know, the enemy knows the bait. And how do we know it's bait? How do we recognize that it's bait? Number one, I need to know the truth. I need to know the truth. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. Remember, we talked about that earlier. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he has never tempted anyone else. Temptations, now this is what you want to underline. Temptations come from our own desires. Say me. Me. They come from my own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death is birth to death. I want to give you some stages of temptation. Maybe you want to write these down. There's a few of them. Number one, the first stage of temptation is actually, I'm tempted. The enemy tempts me. The bait is thrown. It's being drugged in front of me. He's, he's jiggling the, the bait in front of me. And then the next stage of temptation, number two, is what I like to call fantasy. So you see the bait, you see what, what is being thrown in front of you, and then you just begin to fantasize of what it would be, what would happen if you took that bait. What, what, the joy, what, what kind of pleasure would it, bring, would it bring if I enticed that relationship or if I viewed that, whatever that is on the internet, or if I purchased this thing over here, this temptation, the temptation, whatever it is for you, what would it look like? You just begin to fantasize of, the, of what it would look like if you actually bit the bait. And then it goes on from fantasy to moving towards sin moving towards sin. So you begin to fantasize about it, and then all of a sudden you just begin to move slowly toward the sin. And you know, many of you are probably in that stage of life right now. You're, you haven't sinned yet, but you're, it's, it's enticing, and you're moving toward it. You're moving closer. Teenagers used to ask us in student ministry all the time, how far is too far? Anybody been asked that? How far is too far? How far do I go before it's actually sin? And we would tell them all the time, why do you want to know that? Why do you want to know the line that you can get to right before God declares it's sin? You need to run over and over and over and over again. The Bible never says move as close as you can get and, uh, th so that you can not sin and just stay there. Like that's not God's plan for us. Just get as close to the fire as you can get without getting burned. That's, a, that's an exciting idea, right? No, the air, over and over and over again, the Bible says, for us to flee immorality, flee youthful lust, run from sin. Don't get close to it. Run away from it. And many of us are, are, are in the process of life of moving close to it, and we're being enticed by it. And the next stage is not, not only are we moving close to it, but then we actually sin, the act of sin, the act of it. We begin moving close to it, and then you strike, and now you've bitten the bait and you go on from biting the bait, you've sinned, and the Bible says that gives birth to the last stage, death. Death, the last stage of temptation. And many of us have experienced that stage in our life, the, the death of a relationship, the death of our finances, the death of a job, the death of something going on in our life. Why? Because we have gone through every stage of temptation and the enemy has won the battle because we have not proved ourselves through testing seasons. We failed the test over and over and over again and our endurance just isn't there. It's not strong anymore. You know, if my daughter had not fallen off the bike enough times, she would have never gotten fallen off and picked the stickers off. If, if, if it was just that one time she'd fallen off the bike and never given up, and, I mean, just given up and never tried it again, she'd quit. She'd have never moved forward to the next stage. I know she's going to ride a bike because now she's okay with falling. And many of 
of you, you need to be okay with falling. You need to be okay and realize that it's a testing season. It's a testing season in life, and you need to get through those. You need to recognize the truth that when the enemy tempts us, when he tempts us, it's my, I'm drawn away from my own desires. Nobody got it. Nobody did it for me. The devil didn't make me do it. It's nobody's fault. It's my fault. I'm tempted. I'm drawn away of my own desires. Number two, you need to know this. The, the death thing, that's a pretty bad thing. Many of you are probably in the dead season of life, but you need to know there's good news. He provides a way out. You need to know the way out. You need to know the way out. That's a big thing. You need to know that there's a way out. Many of you are gotten, you get discouraged when you think I'm in a dead season of life. God's never going to do anything good with me. But you need to know that God's a good God. He's a God of second chances. James 1, 16 and 17 says this. Don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all, light, who created all the lights in the heavens. Saying this, what's he saying here? Hey, listen, I realize there's a death thing. There's something that comes that it gives birth to death. When you, when you give in to temptation, but there's some good things that God desires to give us. And I believe they're gifts. I'm going to show it to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He, he promises us two things when, in regards to temptation. Uh, verse 13, it says, The temptation in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. Number one, he will not allow temptation to be more than you can stand. Isn't that good? Hey, he's not going to, he doesn't tempt us. But he also puts parameters on when we're tempted. You're, he's never going to allow the enemy to tempt you more than what you can stand. And then number two, when you are tempted, not if, but when, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. That word endure, maybe you want to underline that again. Now it all comes full circle, doesn't it? Why in the world? Why, God, will you allow me to go through this trial? Why would you allow me to go through this test? Because he knows. He knows his ways are higher than ours. He knows that there's a soon coming temptation that you're going to have to endure. There's a soon coming temptation that you're going to have to overcome and you'll never overcome it unless you allow it to grow. Unless you allow your endurance to be built up and your faith to be built up through testing seasons and trials of life. If you won't allow that process to work, you will give in to every temptation that ever comes your way. You'll give in to it because your endurance has not been built. He allows us. He gives us a way out. He helps us provide endurance. And then the last thing I'll share with you this morning I think even is probably the most important is, is you got to know you love Jesus. He provides a way out. What's that way out? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. James 1.18 says this, so he gave birth, uh, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. What's his true word? The Bible tells us in John that the word became flesh and walked among us, that its name is Jesus. He gave us Jesus. And we, out of all creation, this is beautiful right here, became his prized possession became his prized possession. Meaning this, he loves you more than anything that was ever that ever was. You are the prized possession of Jesus and the Father. And you gotta know that you know that you love that you love Jesus. How do I work through this trials? How do I get through the testing season? How do I recognize that it's bait and not give in to temptation? How do I build my endurance to overcome things in life? He goes on to tell us in John 14 and 15, this is the big one. Are you ready? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. How do I know I'm in love with Jesus? I'll keep his commandments. It's not a keep his commandments and then it's, it's because I love him so much, I serve him with my life. How do I know I love Jesus? How do I know my endurance is being built? How do I know my strength of character is being built through seasons of trial in my life? I keep his commandments. I love him. I love him so I live for him. I want to pray with you this morning. Will you bow your heads? You're here this morning and that's you. Man, you're going through some stuff. You're going through a trial. I'm here, my hand's up. You say, Pastor Brandon, I need you to pray for me. There's some stuff I'm going through and, and it's testing me and I need to pass this test. I'm tired of failing. I'm tired of it going. I'm tired of going through the same stuff over and over again. I'm tired of the same financial struggle. I'm tired of the same relational struggle. I'm tired of the same stuff in my job and in my family. I'm tired of it. I'm ready to pass the test. If that's you, nobody's looking. Nobody's looking around. I want to pray with you this morning. If you'll throw that hand up. I'm tired of it. I'm ready to pass the test. Come on, all over this house. I'm ready to pass. I'm tired of the trials. I'm tired of the struggle. I need to recognize it's a test. God, help me get through it. I'm not going to pray anymore. God, get me out of it. God, I, I, need to know, I need to know what do I need to do? What's the steps I need to take? And then maybe you're here this morning. There's a connect card Pastor Adam talked about. I want you to grab that connect card out. And there's going to be an opportunity right now for you to accept a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
You need to know that you love Jesus. How do I know I keep his commandments? So just give, it, give yourself an honest assessment right now. Just be honest with yourself. Nobody's going to call you out, embarrass you. It's between you and God and your connect card. Am I keeping his commandments? Am I serving Jesus? Do I love him? Do I really love Jesus? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Or have you gone through season after season of life failing the test? Never growing in endurance. Never building strength of character. And every time you fall off the bike, it's a big ordeal. And you're ready to quit every time. Today, Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. He wants, to, he, wants to, he wants to be your Savior. He wants to wipe every sin, every shame, every hurt away. And He wants to be your Lord. He wants, to, he wants to guide you, give you wisdom, give you direction on how to live a life that honors Him. So, Father, today we love you. We honor you today. We think we're thankful for your mercy and your grace. God, we're thankful that you give us wisdom. You give us wisdom for the test. You give us answers for the testing seasons. And Jesus, with your help, with your strength, we, we endure. You build our endurance. You provide a way out. You're a good God, a God of second chances. And so Jesus, as we find our way out with you today, we, we ask for wisdom on how to handle trials of life, how to handle testing seasons. And Father, there's those today who need to know they love you. They need to know that they know that they know that they've got a relationship with you, Jesus. So as they mark on their connect cards this morning, I need a relationship with Jesus or I'm recommitting my life to Jesus. Jesus, we just confess there's nothing good inside of us except for you. We confess today that, Jesus, we believe you died and rose again on a cross thousands of years ago and then you rose again conquering death, hell, and the grave so that every dead season in my life can be revived in the name of Jesus. So today as people are, as they were, they're reminded of the dead seasons in their life, they're reminded of the death that has been produced from the sin that they've committed. Jesus, remind them that you're the God of resurrections. Remind them that, you're, that you revive dead things. Remind them that in you, Jesus, there is life, not death. Jesus, we just confess you as our Lord today. We confess you as our Savior. And we thank you that you've thrown it as far as the east is from the west. And we celebrate the goodness of God. Father, today I pray that in these testing seasons, you give us wisdom, you give us endurance, perseverance. You build our faith to overcome the temptation that's coming. We honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. Can we celebrate life change today? Isn't it good? Yeah.